Hello, welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pick and Pay, and welcome back to school. Now, when I finished studying, that was oh, 2001, decades ago, I promised myself that with my first class English degree in honours at the University of Cape Town behind me, a degree that had me set for life as a waiter somewhere, that I would never go back and study again. I'd done all the studying I wanted to do, and I'd laugh at these daft people who went off and did MBAs or did a post-doctorate in medieval fishing studies or something perfectly useless. I was adamant I wasn't going to study again. And that changed this year because having done Dan Really Likes Wine now for four years, I felt I wanted to have a, a little more behind my name in terms of my wine appreciation. And so I had a look at a few courses and there are two that I've embarked upon. I've been doing some stuff with WSET, now I have my level two and I'll be doing my level three early next year. But the one I was really excited about was the Cape Wine Academy, because if I'm living in South Africa, I'm drinking South African wine, and I'm celebrating South African wine, then clearly it's the wine I need to know more about. And so today I'm visiting the headquarters of the Cape Wine Academy and meeting the professor-in-chief who's going to turn me into a Cape wine genius. Heidi Dumini, welcome. Hi, Dan. Thank you for having me. I love this, the Cape Wine Academy. It's kind of like the, the Hogwarts for people who want to drink South African wine. It's Completely. Fantastic. Give me a little bit of history, what it is, how it works, how long it's been going. Mm. So the Cape Wine Academy is over 40 years old. We celebrated our 40th um, birthday last year. And it was inspired by wanting to share the love and appreciation of wine and education of wine uh, with more people in South Africa to build the wine culture, to get some excitement going. And it was um, really, um, at the time, SFW who had a wine plan to do exactly that. And the Cape Wine Academy was the educational arm of that, started by Phyllis Hans and Dave Hughes, who are um, absolute mentors and heroes of the industry, and, and really did put in um, a lot to inspire wine drinking. Um, since then, the Cape Wine Academy has really grown. Uh, we've had more than 250,000 people through our doors um, over this time. And uh, yes, is that I was very, very lucky to um, be given the opportunity Smack bang in the middle of lockdown um, <laughs> to jump in and take over as principal of the academy. Well, congratulations on the thank appointment. Thank you very and, much. And thank, me for thank you for having me involved. And I, I've had my first taste of it because yes. you sent me off to the, the introductory course. To nursery school. To nursery school. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> I learned a great deal. It was great fun. And there were half of Winish there and they drank everything in sight. <laughs> they were great fun. Uh, the, uh, the courses you can do. So if somebody has an interest in wine, uh, what uh, what's available for them and, and how do they get involved? I always like to talk about the South African wine course, which is the foundation course, as a bit like the Tinder date. Is that you you've been you know your curiosity's been piqued. There's something there. There's a bit of chemistry between you and your glass, and you want to go off on a date and see whether you want to learn more about this thing called wine. So the South African wine course is where you start. It's the foundation course and it is a lot of fun. Um, we aim to really set, you know, give you a, a little dip in the, in the pool of the amazing um, path that a, a, an interest in wine can lead to. So that's one of the wonderful things about wine. I know that it can be intimidating for people, but it's really, really unnecessary because you can dig as deep as you want to. So you can go on that course, have a little date with wine, learn some stuff that's really valuable at the dinner table, um, and then just go, oh, that's cool, you know, and just run with your taste, your palate, what you like, what you don't like. And that's another thing that you learn, is if you don't learn what you like, you certainly learn what you don't like. So it gives you so much more confidence as you go along, um, and it, both in a, a social sphere or it opens so many doors to a career in wine, and there's so many different ways that you can use that knowledge. Um, from the South African wine course, you go off into the certificate course, which is a whole lot more crunchy. There you get into blind tasting exams, uh, you write a, quite a serious written exam, and then from there into diploma, which is generally it's in four parts. It takes you two years, and that's the gatekeeper to Cape Wine Masters. Uh, so much to do. It all sounds fascinating. Far more importantly for me, though, especially at this sort of level yes. that we're kicking off today, is that intimidation factor that you mention. And a, a very simple philosophy on Dan really likes wine. Good wine is one you like. A bad wine is one you don't. But understanding why a particular wine is more broadly seen as good or different or, or what its qualities are, this kind of guides you and, and, and allows you to understand all of that. That's it. And have a, you know, the best thing is that you've got to have fun. If you're not having fun, you're in the wrong place. So I just 
thought that we might do a little bit of um, tasting today in a very fun way. Um, but with the South African wine course, if you want to get involved in it, there are three different ways you can do it. You can study yourself online, 100%. You just sign up. You do it in your own time online with your own wines. Um, and it's quick and easy. You can do it in a matter of a few hours. Um, or we have a virtual course, which we've introduced very successfully during lockdown. And that's where you have a live lecturer on Zoom and you get a little kit. So in the kit, you get all the tasting samples uh -huh. like this. It arrives. It's very cute in your, on your doorstep, <laughs> along with your manual and your tasting bag, which contains four glasses. So you've got everything you need to um, get started on your own. And then it's guided. So you have interactivity um, and it's a live lecture. And that's a virtual wine course. Or else we have the classroom wine course, which is what you did last Saturday at the Capitol in Santon, um, where we have very good social distancing and it's all very safe and you'll never have more than 10 people in your class. In it was, and it was a really, really good class. I, I uh, probably uh, further down the wine journey than many of the others who were in that class, mm -hmm. but I still learnt an enormous amount, while at the same token there were people who were really just starting out and they weren't excluded by it. There were a lot yeah. of points of access, which was great. And, and I love the fact that you, you reference it, compare it as a, a Tinder date. I know my friend Ronaldo would be desperate to do the course. <laughs> Anything around Tinder, that's his game. Uh, all right, so I've come to the course. I've got Professor Heidi mm -hmm. looking after me. Uh, I know we're going to start off with some, some bubbles. And yes. it, it's an area that I think people tend to enjoy without often understanding why, mm. um, working out what makes great cup classique, what doesn't. It's, it's probably a little more difficult to differentiate uh, than, uh, than some of the other wine styles. Completely. So uh, give us the introduction and, and what you'd talk us through if we were doing the course. Well, what is really wonderful is that there is now a real awareness of cup classique in South Africa. So, the, you know, people are, are very much... Um, alerted to the fact that there's sparkling wine which is just carbonated like coca-cola um, you know that stuff that you get at weddings um, but there also is this wonderful thing which is south africa's champagne um, although we can't use the word champagne because it's simply not from champagne so in 50 years ago um, next year uh, Simon Sik launched the very first cup classique in south africa with the first bottle fermented sparkling wine so it's not really the you know how the bubble gets into the wine is more important than the place that it's grown um, when you're talking about quality and sparkling wine after that it takes on all the the personality of where it comes from its origin but you have to rear it right or you have to make it right so um cup classic is bottle fermented it's um the capes own version, so you can't call a sparkling wine that's been bottle fermented anywhere else in the world the Cap Classique because it will never have the personality of the Cape. And nowadays, the um, Cap Classique has, is really um, starting to show a personality in its own right and a category in its own right. We're working with the sun um, to really capture the fruit flavors and, and make it absolutely beautifully harmonious with a bottle fermentation character, which is the yeast in it. So we're drinking Siemens of Cups of Funko. This was the very first the one. The very first one. Obviously not this exact bottle. But no, 1971. This is the 2018. They've come quite, somewhere, uh, f quite far. And they do use the traditional varieties of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Um, and it's left on the lees for 12 months. So that's also a good thing. It means that it develops that extra dimension of bottle fermented beauty, where some of them that have, by law, up until 2020, you only had to leave it on the lees for nine months. So, yes, this is Simon Sip, but this oh. is a little palate cleanser, so cheers, Dad. Cheers, thank you. Mm. Mm. And there's been a massive trend in the, the nectars, you know, the, the, which is really the demi sec category, the semi. Just a little dry. bit sweeter. Yes. Um, and that is, it, it's, it's captured the imagination of an entry level drinker, but they really do know that they still want a bottle for me to sparkling wine with all of the pedigree and the character, and not just a Coca-Cola or a carbonated bubbly. This is 2018. We know that it's been going since 1971. Would there be any 71 still in existence? And, and what sort of shelf life would this have? Should I be drinking this immediately, or can I keep this for five, ten years? No, so that is one of the wonderful things about uh, uh, bottle fermented um, sparkling wine, champagne, or Cap Classique, or Carver, um, is that it has the benefit of the bubble, which preserves it for longer, and it has a, a huge shelf life. Now, something like the Simons of Cops of Funkel 2018 
what they've really set out to do is release it when they believe it's ready to drink. So this is, this is their um, entry level, um, sparkling wine and uh, Cap Classique, and they really would say that it's ready to drink. However, because of the benefit of the carbon dioxide, is that this will keep for five years easily and develop gorgeous richness. In fact, on Saturday, I had the pleasure of being at their vintage day where we were tasting 2003 carps of Funkos that were just too gorgeous for words, you know, mm. golden and nutty. And it was like drinking creme brulee. It was absolutely beautiful with, with a bubble that was still quite fresh and, and vibrant. It, it was really quite amazing. And of course, with time comes experience. And, you know, especially the Grand Becks, the Simon Sikh or Cabrera, the, the, the guys that have been going for a long time, they now have that benefit and track record to be able to really understand what, how to work with, with um, Cap Classique and our climate. Um, and so now it really is that the different styles are emerging. It's a wonderful category. It's a real Cape treasure. And uh, oh, it is. I, I genuinely believe, though, not to put none, I think that some of the French champagnes are definitely getting right up there with our entry level cup to seek. So keep going, France. <laughs> Make an effort. We appreciate You've it. You've only had 600 years practice. You know, I'm <laughs> All right. uh, our well, 50 years innings are doing us well. <laughs> so that is a lovely way to start off the mm. session. Um, let's go into the, the tasting. And I've already done this, uh, but we're going to repeat it for the sake of the cameras. I did this during the course, and it's a, a very simple but very effective way of explaining flavour and explaining the palate. Yes. Um, and I love the way you've done it, I love the selections. Explain why I've got a collection of citrus, pretzels, cocoa beans, I think, it's jelly beans, mm -hmm. and, and what their reason is for being there. Okay, so what we want to do in this situation is show you, you know, when you, st of course, wine exists within a lifestyle, and very often a lifestyle around food. So what we're wanting to do is try and show you if you prod the different sense, senses, what happens to the same wine in the glass? And for me, every single time I do this, I'm amazed because it's like a magic trick. Um, but it really does make a lot of sense and start to put, you know, connect the dots about which wine goes with which food. So we do this thing called cause and effect, where we just stimulate your sweet, sour, salty, and bitter taste buds and taste the same wine to see what it does. So. In the first glass, I've just chosen two wines, which in the course we would also taste blind, um, and you, we would just assess it. Now with this one, you can get a lot of very exuberant fruit character, right? There's honey melon, passion fruit, guava, and a little bit of vanilla even. Mm. Gorgeous palate weight. Mm. It gives the impression of being almost off dry because it's just so packed with so much character, fruit yeah. character, which followed through from the nose. And then it gives your palate a huge, great big hug. And I can still taste it as I'm talking to you. So this wine is quite a substantial white wine. And if I breathe out through my nose, I can detect some sort of oaky influence on it as well. Um, but it's just... What we're trying to do here is just benchmark it as a really lovely, well-balanced, dry white wine, right? Mm. Now what we're going to do is just take a little bit of lemon, and we taste the lemon, and then we taste the wine, and just see how it's changed the wine. Oh, It's not tequila. Don't get excited. <laughs> <laughs> And immediately, it turns into dessert wine. Completely. <laughs> now, this is, this is just a wonderful, what, it's become broad and rounded, and so it's, it's got almost the, the complexity of the wine is even more there because you're yeah. not getting the interference of the grip at the end. Yeah. So when you are drinking a wine, if what you're eating has got more acid than the wine itself, it's always going to bring out the fruit. It's going to temper the acidity in the wine, and it's going to bring out the fruit character in the wine and make it appear much broader and richer. But a completely different wine, right? Oh, yeah. Mm. I'm imagining this with, say, some, um, some lemon-soaked line fish. Where, exactly. Uh, it's going to pair delightfully, but also give you a, a completely different story to the wine. That's right. Mm. That would go really well. And then we go into salty. So we've got a little pretzel. 
we're just stimulating the salty taste buds. And then if you taste it, so the wine has changed again, right? It's made it back to its dry self. Mm -hmm. In fact, it, I'm getting more of a pithy grapefruit finish. Yeah. And it's got more of that tang on the end. Mm -hmm. So what um, salty or savory flavors do is they turn up the really good character in the wine, but it also makes the wine appear more dry. Okay. Yeah. Now, it's not, not as dramatic a difference as with the lemon. No. Um, it's more subtle, but it's definitely there. And it, the, yeah, it feels just a bit more pronounced. Yeah, and it's definitely got a major palate go more it's not as fruity and rounded yeah, as the first mm. the next one um so we always do this with uh, 75 percent dark chocolate covered coffee beans to really stimulate your bitterness which is at the back of your palate and <laughs> brace yourself <laughs> what jeez <laughs> mm. i love i love i could chew coffee beans so i love the bitterness but will the la wine love the bitterness? Let's sure. try. I don't think I'm going to sleep until February. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I think your face says it all. <laughs> so what happens when the food that you're eating is more bitter than the wine that you're drinking? It's going to bring up all the bitterness of the wine. So it's pronounced any bitterness. So at the back of your throat, you really do get yeah. that. But the other thing is that because it's covered with chocolate, and this is a, a really great point because there's some people that really love the combination of wine and chocolate. And I'm not of that opinion, but there are some people who really love extreme clashes in flavor, mm. and that is an extreme clash. Still it's getting stripped, shivers. Yeah, it strips Look. the wine of all its fruit. Yeah. And all you really get is wet bitterness in your mouth, right? Mm. Even from this beautiful wine that tasted so fruity and so rotten and gorgeous yeah. to begin with. It was delightful <laughs> three minutes ago. What have you done? Bring it back. Uh, so let's try one more. All okay. Right. So a little jelly bean <laughs> mm, is going to stimulate the sweetness. Now, sweetness you get on, you detect at the tip of your tongue. And I've done this so often, and I tend to <laughs> want to just put the wine in my mouth so it skips the tip because I know what's coming. <laughs> 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 but if we taste them, hmm. So if what you're eating is sweeter than the wine that you're drinking, it's going to strip the wine of all its fruit completely. And herein lies the problem is that, you know, what happens is that people get very comfortable in a social situation around a table, and they really want to stick with the wine that they're drinking when they move on to dessert. And most often they're not. It doesn't really work. But people will really try and make it work. <laughs> Which is a pity because it leads so often to people not celebrating the staggeringly good dessert wine we have in South Africa. All right, so we've done uh, we've done this. We've, we've done the white. Compared them, and it's been a really nice yes. reminder of the palate and the impact of food. Uh, we've then got the red. Yes. Um, Are you curious to know what the white is? Um, I'm guessing it's a Shannon. It's definitely a Shannon, and it's definitely a mighty fine pedigree Shannon. Mm -hmm. But you can get that. It's got oodles of complexity and. Gorgeous balance, right? Swatland Shannon? Swatland Shannon is mm. on the money. Uh, -da -da -dum. Oh, I think I, kn knowing, uh, knowing some of the estates that you work with, I think I can probably then guess that there's an American hand at play. <laughs> yes, there you go. We have the Malino Old Vines White, uh, which is Shannon Blanc. Do you have time to do the red? I, most definitely. Let's, let's have I, a little whip of the red. And probably what I'm most fascinated about is mm. I've seen what these three have done to the white to see mm. if it is exactly the same story with the red or if there are some slight differences. Yeah, because now, remember, we're introducing tannin. Yeah. Lovely texture of tannin. Um, so obviously the tannin comes from the, red, from the grape skins and the pips and sometimes the, and a little bit from the barrels. So the texture is what we're looking at here and how it's going to change it. But this is a beautiful full-bodied red. Um, it's quite useful. Mm. All that really nice black and blue fruit. It's very plush and juicy. With some lovely black pepper and spice coming through. Yeah. Um, it's, it's also a really nice balanced wine. Certainly accessible now. But it's got the body to it that you could definitely use as a food pairing wine. Mm. Okay. Brave. 
Go in for your second, your second lemon. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> I clearly don't have the experience <laughs> with the Mexican drinks that you do. <laughs> that was... huh. Ooh. Now, I should be more used to lemon because having married into a Greek family, the Greeks put lemon on ice cream Truth. and on toast yes. and peanut butter and everything. Um, and I do love lemon, but oh, straight up, it's a bit much. <laughs> mm. Mm. <coughs> Again, it's a completely different ride. No, it's mm. me sort of turn into a Merlot or a Malbec. Or yeah, so, so completely juicy mm. and broad and... Yeah. And it really, really does bring out the the fruit rather than the, the um, tannin and acid. Yeah. So there's no aggression. Makes it very smooth and very palatable. Mm. Very different wine. Yeah. That's it. And it's it's when you do it at this extreme level yeah. that you really realise what you're actually doing to wine every time you have a meal with it. Correct. And we, and we don't think about that. No. So and it's usually not what the wine does to the food, but the other way around. Yeah. So another tip I always give people is try not to have the wine and the food in your mouth at the same time. I know it sounds obvious, but try to, to make wine sandwiches where you taste the wine and then food and swallow and then the wine and yeah. not have everything in your mouth at the same time because obviously your senses are going to get quite confused. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's also something you need to, to almost train yourself to do because, believe it or not, it's, it's almost you, you reaching for your drink while you're still yeah. eating. Mm. But I always think of it a bit with wine and food pairing. It's, it's a scale of, of things. So when you, when you put something on one side, another thing goes up or down, right? So again, is if the, the, the food you're eating is more acidic than the wine that you're drinking, it's going to make the wine appear less acidic. So it just goes up. I always think about it if I'm preparing wine for meals, I love cooking and then inflicting my food upon people. Uh, I love the sense of the food and the wine in battle but you want a fair fight where they're just bringing <laughs> the best out of each other. Because if you've got one way stronger than the other, then you're losing out. You so see, now, I prefer to think of it as a romance where they really pair well <laughs> rather than... <laughs> that Tinder date has gone perfectly. <laughs> rather than a duel. <laughs> oh, Let's right. go for the salty. Okie doke. Mm. So what it does is it brings it back a bit. So it brings back some of the texture, some of the grip, yeah. but it still really, really works to bring out that savouriness, brings out um, all the best of the fruit in the wine. So salty fruits do tend to work really well with red wine rather than white wine. It tends to make a white wine a little bit more bitter. Mm. Yeah, I'm pleasantly surprised by that. It, uh, it's amplified it very nicely. And this one is actually a really valid one with, with the, the coffee bean because... Very often, people order their coffee at the end of a meal while they've still got red wine in their glass. Yeah. It's, it really is a thing. So, yeah. the other thing... And of thing course, there are, there are some estates that we don't need to mention for whom the blur between wine and coffee, and uh, in particular, pinotage, <laughs> has become <laughs> difficult to delineate. We don't want the coffee in our wine. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Whoa. So, I don't drink coffee at all. Oh, so that must be a big hit of coffee for you. So, mm. Sure. Mm. Uh, Remember as well is that the point is not really the coffee other than the bitterness and the dark chocolate and the, the coffee do that for you. It's, it's very bitter at the back of your palate. Mm. <laughs> you know, there's some people, that's what I say, is that there, there's extreme people who really, really do love this clash. Yeah, I'm not one of them. <laughs> But oh. the, the, what it does is that it makes the wine more bitter and it strips the fruit again. So you really then again get this interplay. Um, but the no. dark chocolate actually does work slightly for me with the, with the wine because it makes, it, you know those... No, um, it's horrible. No, have you ever had those chocolates with, the, <laughs> with like the um, dark cherry syrup inside? Ah, uh, sort of muscarine. It's got, yeah, it's, yeah. Got, it's got that kind of thing going Again, for it. Again, not one of my favourites. So but it's not that something be... that I would choose. And I would certainly never choose to pair a red wine with a chocolate dessert. 
There are so many other things, like a, a really nice port or brandy, that will go so much better with a yeah. chocolate dessert. But a lot, of, a lot of people do, and they're not wrong, because I always say that if you're swallowing and you're paying the bill, you're right. Um, <laughs> but it's not, I, I just do think that it's a huge injustice to the wine itself. Yeah. Hey, there are times it works. I've done the, the Waterford chocolate and wine pairing on many mm. occasions. And I don't like all of them, but a lot of them do strike a really nice chord. And some of them are, are what's in the chocolate. Exactly. And yeah. they've made that chocolate specifically for a wine, Correct. rather than just hoping the two of them collide and yeah. both come out alive. But if you are going to do chocolate and wine, then you must go for, for dark chocolate. Is that there's no hope of a milk chocolate actually matching a yeah. wine. It's, this, the sugar is simply too high. Mm. And to illustrate that is that the jelly bean is the, one, the last <laughs> one. <laughs> I'm even going to have a dark jelly bean too. <laughs> Does the colour of the jelly bean impact? Not really. But I do <coughs> suggest that if you're teaching yourself to taste, the artificial flavours in jelly beans and fruit sparkles really do help. Like if you want to know what does black currant taste like, have a black currant fruit sparkle, have a uh, lemon fruit sparkle, yeah. have an orange fruit sparkle, and actually even suck the fruit. Uh, uh, suck the wine like you would a fruit sparkle because you, you, you then really start to understand mm. the intrinsic differences. It helps. It's not really very um, good teaching practice, but yeah, it really does help. <laughs> uh, you'll notice that my jelly bean container is still full. I have been now almost two years clean of eating <laughs> sweets, and so I've skipped those. But uh, you, uh, you gave us a very good assessment on, on the white. Do you think it works with the red, the jelly no, bean? No, mm. terrible. It's ah. like completely strips the wine of all its fruit. Excellent. Yeah. Glad I didn't have it. No. <laughs> the only oh. thing I can taste is the sugar. Yes. Mm. No, it's not a great match. No. Ah. So, but again, is that you really would never say it was the same wine in your glass. Mm. I mean, it's like four different wines. Um, mm. So this is one of the, the things that you learn on the first one. Um, and it's just kind of fun that yeah. we do. Nothing serious. Mm. It is, uh, the, uh, the pairing might not have been superb, but the wine certainly is. Um. <laughs> As I said, if you don't find what you do like, you're going to find what no, you, you don't, don't. like. <laughs> um, were you drinking Shiraz? Well done. It is a Shiraz. You reckon it's a warmer climate oh. or a cooler climate? Hmm. Given that my palate has been assaulted by this collection <laughs> of additives you've thrown at me, <laughs> Professor. Um, I'm honestly not sure. Mm. It is a warmer climate. Yeah. It's inland. And it's a, it's a Shiraz specialist producer. It's yeah, also one of my okay. favorites. So know. say hello to Sarensburg ah, Province in Shiraz. Hello, Sarensburg. I've drunk your wine on many occasions. Yes, and it's <laughs> the Provenance, which is always a very, very delicious wine for social drinking um, mm. and they, they're really good with their Shiraz but yeah. one of the things that we um, can't do on the virtual course is send you the lemon but on the virtual course you do get all of the elements except for the lemon along with your little tasting pack and your t pack of glasses so it's quite cool to do this at home as okay. well. So people can actually just order these get them in their own home and have a course yeah. taught to them. You know what is that would what would be quite fun is maybe to invite some of your audience to South Africa yes. to a virtual course. That would be fantastic. We do that? Yeah, how about it? I think that is a brilliant idea. We, I think uh, you better get some of your regulars out there yeah. and some people who love wine and we'll entertain them to oh, a little great. course sometime soon. That sounds like a great idea. So keep an eye out on all of our channels. Uh, I'll set a date with Heidi. Now we'll see if some of you can come along and join us and, uh, and just have some fun with some terrific South African wine. And it's, uh, it is such a cool way to learn. And to well, you know what Winston Churchill little... said, right? He said that wine should be a laugh, not a lecture. So you need to be somewhere where you do the course and then you carry on um, enjoying your wine with food and um, you really make it a memorable occasion. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, it generally is, but it's going to be all the more so when we do this particular course. So you're oh, going to see more of me and Heidi <laughs> as we get together. I'm doing, uh, I'm one course down. I'm moving on to the second one with the Cape Wine Academy, and it's been a, a really fun so far, which is important. Uh, but maybe try out that Tinder date with a, a Cape Wine <laughs> course to, uh, to start off with. Uh, and I think in, in closing, what this does for me is just reinforce what we try and do every single week on Dan Really Likes Wine. And that's showcase.
just how extraordinary the South African wine scene is. Yeah, completely. And, uh, you know, how far we've come. And our story is such an interesting one. And actually, we really have captured the imagination of the, the global wine community, um, maybe for a sympathy vote at the moment, but truthfully, at least they're taking notice of how good our wines are. Um, and there's a new wave that's unstoppable. So there's such exciting things happening in the industry. And despite this little stumble in the road, um, I think we're strong. I could not agree more. If you have a look on screen now, you'll see the websites. You can drop over to the Cape Wine Academy, have a look at the courses, have a look at how you get involved, and watch your inbox if you're a Dan Really Likes Wine regular. We'll see if a few of you can join us in the next few weeks for that very special tasting of Professor Heidi and <laughs> some South Africa. Heidi, thank you so much. It's been an absolute Lisa. delight. <laughs> and, uh, and it's an education as always. Every it's a pleasure, Dr. Education. Dan. <laughs> Dan might need a doctor after a couple of these pairings. Oh, those coffee beans. So that wraps us up for another week on Dan Really Likes Wine. Thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting. Make sure you're a member of that Pick and Pay Wine Club if you aren't already. And look out for our live tastings every Monday and Thursday. And coming up privately in the next few weeks, that very special tasting with the professor. Goodbye. <laughs>